Okay, should we start? Yes, please. Are it's great to be here. Too slow on my part. Okay, so our topic is usury in medieval Jewish thought. Originally, I wanted to cover uh, other topics as well, including just price. And I saw that number one, usury is the most interesting topic. Number two, it would be way too broad to try to cover so many topics. So we're going to um, concentrate on usury. There are also going to be chapters on usury in Christian thought and in Islamic thought. Okay, medieval Jewish literature. What do we mean by that? Well, periodization, 1050 to 1565. Some would say that I should end uh, at 1492 when the Jews were expelled from Spain or even a bit earlier, but I want to include the authoritative law code Shulchan Aruch by Rabbi Joseph Caro. That's considered canonical to this day. I mean, if there are deviations from it in today's Orthodox Jewish practice, there may be some communal traditions, but by and large, this is considered canonical. Uh, exactly how, that's another discussion. Okay, types of literature. We have legal literature, that includes Talmudic co uh, commentaries on the Talmud. Uh, that includes codes of Jewish law, including Rabbi Karo's code. There are three major codes. Um, and responsa literature, where rabbis correspond with uh, the people, send them questions uh, via letter and get uh, answers. And there are more than a million responsa that have survived. There's even a CD, it was a CD database, now it's online. bar Ilan University maintains the Responsa Project database. So it's searchable and everything. Okay, um, the medieval rabbis regarded the Babylonian Talmud, which was redacted 500 CE, as canonical. And what that means is they can't dispute an unequivocal dictum of the Talmud. What they can do is interpret, and they can also decide between differing opinions where the Talmud did not uh, say what the law is. But they can't just dispute something and say, this is illogical, this makes no sense. Then we have biblical commentaries, and we also have ethical and philosophical works. Uh, polemical works, you know, the Jewish Christian disputations are not really informative. So we're going to exclude those. Okay, my main thesis, which I'll present at the outset, is that there's this striking contrast between the harsh moral condemnations of usury in medieval Jewish literature, and on, on the one hand, and on the other hand, the legal flexibility that was demonstrated by the medieval rabbis who saw the reality saw the need of the community to uh, earn a living, and in the realities of um, medieval commercial life, certain things had to be permitted, even if when you read the Talmud, literally, uh, these things would appear to be prohibited. So condemnations, which we'll see very soon, and on the other hand, leniency. Let's start with the condemnations. Usury is like a snake bite. You don't see the damage at the beginning. And eventually, you see that it's very, very damaging. That's in uh, Rashi and Maimonides. Rashi is the greatest uh, commentator of all time on, on the Bible, on the Talmud. He's the starting point. There are disputes. His own grandchildren often disputed him. But you have to start with Rashi. Maimonides writes, and this, this is from the Talmud. This, he's not originating this. He's just quoting the Talmud. When he writes a usurious con loan contract is as, he, as, as if he documents and has witnesses testify about him that he has no portion in the God of Israel. Furthermore, all those who borrow, no, notice the condemnation of the borrower as well. All those who borrow or lend with interest are like deniers of the God of Israel and the exodus from Egypt. Fundamentals of the faith, that is heretical to lend with interest. Rabbi Jacob and Asher, author of the Tour Legal Code, uh, adds his possessions collapse. 
This is also in the Talmud. For some reason, Maimonides omitted it. I have a feeling that I know why, but we won't get into that now. His possessions collapse. That's in the same Talmudic passage. So you're not going to profit from usury. That's the message. Money obtained via usury is minudeh, untouchable or excommunicated. Julie Mel cites this from Rabbi Judah of Regensburg, a German pietist. And unrepentant usurers will not be resurrected in the Messianic age. So the resurrection of the dead in the Messianic age, that's supposed to be a tremendous event uh, that Jews hope for and yearn for throughout the generations. And usurers will be excluded from that. They stay dead forever. They're condemned. And you also see this in the Spanish uh, moralistic work uh, Gates of Repentance by Rabbi Yona Girondi. Let's begin um, the legal theory, and let's start with the principles or dicta that are within the consensus by the time of um, the medieval rabbis. Number one, usury from Gentiles is permitted. Maimonides writes it's actually a positive commandment of the Torah to <laughs> lend to non-Jews with interest. It doesn't matter whether the borrower is rich or poor. From the Bible, it might seem that it does matter, but the rabbi said it doesn't matter. Biblically prohibited interest, that means a directly stipulated interest at the outset, we state uh, explicitly that there's interest in this contract, that's recoverable in court. However, rabbinically prohibited interest, which is also called dust of interest, it's generated indirectly through a business transaction. That isn't recoverable in court. So there's this important distinction between biblically prohibited interest on the one hand and rabbinically prohibited interest on the other hand. Rabbinically prohibited interest remains prohibited, but it's not recoverable in court. If the lender dies, his sons are generally not obligated to return interest. What's the exception? That if the father wanted to repent, but he passed away before he could repent, and there's this um, item that everyone sees and everyone knows this is from usury, like a garment or a cow, then the son should return it because of the honor of their father. That's a Talmudic principle, but in general, you know, you have money, it's in a bank account, it's not seen, no obligation to return it. The heirs don't have to return it. Usurers and borrowers on interest are disqualified as witnesses, among other retrobates, uh, reprobates, I should say. Uh, says Maimonides, all are wicked people who are disqualified because they corruptly take money that is not theirs. In other words, we can't trust them to testify truthfully. Right, habitual gamblers, and, and this all comes from the Babylonian Talmud. He's not making this up. Okay, disputed questions of legal theory. You could say that these are disputed even to this, to this day in religious academies. Is usury inherently unjust, as some would put it, contrary to natural law, like theft? Or, it is, it, or is it inherently just, but nevertheless Scripture prohibited it. Second question, is the usury prohibition, as Kirschenbaum puts it, Kirschenbaum, legal scholar, uh, passed away, I think, a few years ago. Um, is the usury prohibition a novel definition of robbery? In a minute, we'll see why he says a novel definition or a unique sui generis, a religious prohibition of a quasi-ritualistic nature. I mean, he's leaving open the possibility that the usury prohibition is between man and God, not between man and his fellow, but between man, man and God, like something ritual. You know, you didn't pray today. That's between man and God. You didn't observe whatever ritual commandments. Okay, after interest has been paid in violation of Jewish law, so let's say they violated the law, which party is the legal owner? 
borrower or the lender? There are no explicit answers to these questions. Rather, they were implicit in various legal statements. Now, let me tell you by heart the implicit answer to uh, whether usury is theft. Is usury actually theft? Well, the answer is no. Why is the answer no? Not because someone came out and stated it explicitly, but because theft is prohibited. It doesn't matter what's the faith of the victim. Theft from anybody, from any human being is prohibited. Usury is permitted and perhaps commanded with non-Jews. Some would say that the brother and the other versus the other, right? There's a whole book about that. So it can't be equivalent to theft 100%, right? Because if it were equivalent to theft 100%, it would be prohibited to uh, collect interest from anybody of any faith. Three approaches that I saw. One approach says it's robbery, albeit a novel definition of robbery, as Kirschenbaum says. If interest was paid in violation of the law, it's the borrower who owns it. What's the nature of the obligation to return the interest? Interest is stolen property, and stolen property needs to be returned. Is it possible to place a lien on the property of the lender? If he doesn't return the interest, place a lien on his property? Yes, we can. It's possible to do that. Stolen property, stolen property, doesn't return it, we place a lien on his property. Then there's an intermediate position, which we call the monetary position. The monetary position uh, says that the legal owner of the interest is the lender, even though he wasn't allowed to take it in the first place, but the lender owns it. Yes, he has to return it, but right now he owns it. The nature of the obligation to return it is monetary. We'll see exactly what that means. And it is possible to place a lien on his property in the event that he refuses to return it. The quasi-ritualistic view says that the legal owner of the interest is the lender, even though he should not have taken the interest ab initio, it's his. There's a quasi-ritualistic obligation to return the interest. We'll see exactly what that means soon. And unlike the other two approaches, it's not possible to put a lien on his property, right? If this is a ritualistic thing, no lien. Each approach is consistent with some legal dicta, but inconsistent with others. That's why it's not so clear cut. And to this day, we have these three approaches. This text is a bit long, but I didn't want to take it out of context. This is from Maimonides' Mishnah Torah the code of Maimonides. There are three major codes in Judaism. Maimonides, Rabbi Jacob ben Asher uh, wrote the tour, and Rabbi Karo Shulchan Aruch. Interestingly, Rabbi Karo wrote commentaries on each of his predecessors, and uh, they're, they're masterpieces. It's, it's the breadth of, the, of his knowledge of, his, of the previous uh, authorities is just astounding. Now, um, Maimonides, he says that there were some of the Geonim rabbis from 650 to 1050 between the Talmudic period and his own period. Some of them ruled that if the borrower waived the interest, he says, it's fine with me. You don't have to return the interest to me. Or he actually waived the interest ab initio. This, the commentators picked up on this. Here it says that he collected, for the lender collected or will collect. So it looks like either ab initio or we're in a court of law and the court says you have to return it. In, those, in both of those situations, if the borrower uh, says, I waive the interest, that has no legal validity. Scripture did not waive it. You can't waive it. It has no validity. You, have no, you don't have permission from God to waive interest. Says Maimonides, this is incorrect. 
because if the, the, the judges instruct the lender to return the interest to the borrower and the lender knows he violated a prohibition, the commentaries have a field day with this. Why is he saying all of this, right? And the borrower is entitled to restitution. Uh, now, the words that I emphasize. If the borrower wishes to waive the interest, he may do so in the same way as the victim of a theft forgives a theft. So it looks like Maimonides is taking the robbery approach. Now, some would say you can interpret this as consistent with the monetary approach. I won't get into that, but simple wording, it sounds like monetary approach. A simple wording sounds like robbery approach. And his proof text is, I don't really want to go off topic, but there's an idea that the community allows usurers to repent without having to restore, without having to pay. Because if we make them pay, people will say, I'm going to lose my whole fortune. What's the point? And then they'll continue to engage in usury. So we want to say, you stop engaging in usury from now until you commit that you're going to stop. You don't have to return the money that you uh, accumulated from usury. You want to incentivize repentance. So if the community is supposed to waive, then there is such a thing as waiver. This, this is a Talmudic statement. So there is waiver. There is such a thing. It's valid. So waiver is valid, just like the victim of a theft may waive. Maimonides appears to be taking the robbery approach. An example of the monetary approach, this one's very simple. Rashi in his Talmud commentary states, the court forces the lender to return the interest if the borrower sues him, sues him in his lifetime. That's a Talmudic dictum. Generally, the heirs are not obligated to return the interest, so he has to sue in his lifetime. But let's place the emphasis on he has to sue implication, the borrower must sue to recover interest. And if he doesn't, the courts won't do anything. Consistent with the monetary approach. And as we shall see, it's not consistent with the quasi ritualistic view. Now, this wasn't universally accepted. Rabbi Caro was silent. The commentators on the Rabbi Caro disagree as to whether Rashi's uh, statement here is the law or is not the law, but be that as it may, Rashi seems to say, clearly says, the borrower must sue to recover interest. This is a monetary thing. If it were robbery, why does the borrower have, why, why does the victim of a theft have to sue? The court should intervene if they see theft, right? Just do something about it. If you don't sue, your problem, that must be a monetary uh, obligation. Quasi-ritualistic approach. And this is fascinating, surprising, I would say. From the Nemuke Yosef, Talmud commentary by Rabbi Joseph Chaviva of Spain. It's actually a commentary on the Alfasi. The Alfasi is a distillation of the Talmud, and it concentrates only on the legal, excluding the homiletical. But that, that subtlety is not critical. It's a form of Talmud commentary. And uh, Rabbi Chaviva says the following. The judges would coerce the creditor to return interest in order to fulfill the positive commandment, your brother shall live with you. And they would flog him until his soul departs. That's figurative, obviously. They're not supposed to kill anybody. But someone who refuses to return interest that he collected may be flogged by the court. As with other positive commandments, and here's the interesting quote, if one said, I will not make a tabernacle, in the fall, there's a holiday of tabernacles. In Israel, we start the academic calendar afterwards. And that's why I, when I fly back, I have to administer a final exam. Whereas most of you, I think, are done with the exams already. Um, holiday of tabernacles in the fall, Person says, I will not make a tabernacle. The commandment is to sit in the tabernacle, to eat in the tabernacle, to sleep in the tabernacle, weather permitting. Or I will not take a palm branch, that is the four species of tabernacles. That's the other commandment, to take the, uh, the palm branch, the citron, the willow, and the myrtle. Person says, I'm not doing it. The court 
will flog him until his soul departs. However, the court does not seize his assets. We're talking about the usurer now because his assets are not subject to encumbrance. And if this were not so, then this law that the heirs don't have to return interest really wouldn't make sense because if the father had real estate, then there'd be an encumbrance on the real estate. So there's no lien on the property. This is the opinion of Rabbi Shmuel Ben Aderet of Spain and Rabbi Nisim Gurondi uh, concurred. Now, the main point here is that the obligation to return interest, he's likening this to the obligation to perform ritual commandments. Someone who doesn't perform ritual commandments, the court flogs him until he changes his mind. I, there's a whole theory behind this that really the person has been overcome by the evil inclination or by uh, hubris, and the court can break down those you know, but deep down inside, he wants to do the right thing, and the court has to find a way to get him to do what he really wants to do deep down inside. If flogging is necessary, then that, that's what the court does. That's the theory behind it. I don't think this is practice today, but that's the idea. Uh, so it's like a person who won't do a ritual commandment between him and God. We flog him until he agrees to do it. Same thing here. He's not willing to return the interest. We flog him until he changes his mind and agrees to do it. Quasi-ritualistic. Now we move to some of the leniencies uh, that the medieval rabbis instituted under pressure from commercial realities. I'm not gonna have enough time to get into what those commercial realities were. I can refer you to the appropriate, uh, appropriate uh, academic uh, references. We'll talk about the theory and the ideas behind the leniencies and uh, what the leniencies were, how the medieval rabbis uh, differed in their rulings from what would appear to be the ruling based on the Talmud. So let's begin with two essential Talmudic uh, dicta. I have six forms of leniency. I don't know if we'll get to all of them. Let's take a quick look at the clock. And we'll see if we can get to all of them. Uh, I'll try to include all of them in the chapter. Okay, so two essential Talmudic dicta that we need to know. Number one, there is no agency for a Gentile. That's shorthand. What it means is, a Gentile cannot act as an agent for a Jew, and a Jew cannot act as an agent for a Gentile. It goes both ways. What does that mean? That if in the perception of a layman, we see a Gentile acting on behalf of a Jew, in the eyes of the law, the Gentile is a principal. He's acting on his own behalf, and it doesn't matter what it looks like to us. What it looks like to the untrained layman doesn't matter. A Gentile acts, he's acting on his own behalf, even if it looks to us like he, to untrained layman, that he's acting on behalf of a Jew. The Lord doesn't recognize any agency between Jew and Gentile. And if a Jew acted on behalf of a Gentile, in the eyes of the Lord, the Jew is regarded as a principle. He's acting on his own behalf only. That's number one. We'll see how rabbis will use this to allow certain transactions that otherwise might not be allowed. Second dictum, and this is it's a consensus. There's no question that this is what the Talmud said. The Torah only prohibited interest that comes from the debtor to the creditor. That is, there's a bilateral relationship between the debtor and the creditor. Triangular relationships are Permitted, for example, this is from Soloveitch 2013, who I'm going, going to quote in the coming uh, slides. If there's a separation between the debtor and payer of principal and the payer of interest, C pays the interest on behalf of A to B, the creditor, and 
C is acting independently. C is not acting as the agent of A. If C is acting as the agent of A, then A and C are one and the same. And we're talking about two Jews, obviously. Uh, so C cannot act on behalf of A. But if C independently pays the interest to B in connection with the loan from a B to A, that would be permissible. That's a triangular relationship, not a bilateral relationship. Only bilateral relationships were prohibited by the Talmud. Triangular relationships such as this are permitted. There's another triangular relationship in uh, Soloveitchik's book, but, but I'll, um, this will be enough for now to illustrate the idea. So based on these two dicta, we have certain leniencies. One circumvention in medieval Germany is called the Schadenemin, or acceptance of loss. And this comes from Soloveitchik 2013. He's the absolute master of, of this medieval literature. What was going on in France and Germany versus Provence, you know, absolute encyclopedic knowledge of the uh, sources. I'm just giving you some, you know, tip of the iceberg, some examples. Uh, he actually has some nice graphs. I was thinking of uh, putting them in my slides. Copyright concerns, I don't know. But in the original, he has graphic depictions of these transactions. But let's describe it verbally as best we can. January 1st, Jew 1 borrows $100 from a Gentile for one month at 4% a month. A month later, February 1st, Jew 1 lacks cash, can't repay. So what does he do? I illiquid. What does he do? He gives the Gentile a silver platter and he says, go to J2, another Jewish uh, person, and pawn the platter with him for $104. And that's how you get repaid. I will redeem my pawn later. So my problem, how to get the pawn back. I will accept the loss that's shot in him. I accept the loss that I will incur by paying the accumulated interest from now until then. That's my problem that I have to pay interest on this and how to get the pawn is my problem. And the Gentile goes and pawns the platter and obtains the 104 uh, dollars. And that uh, becomes a loan at 4% uh, a month interest and J1 is going to have to pay back 104 plus interest in order to get back his platter. Now on March 1st, J1 doesn't go directly to J2. It gives 108.16 to the Gentile and asks the Gentile to repay Jew 2 and get the platter back, which he does. And uh, J1 gets back his platter. Is this permissible or not? So there are two ways that we could view this transaction or this series of transactions. Construction A says, and this is how a layman I think might view it, that uh, Jew one borrows an interest from Jew two with the Gentile acting as Jew one's agent, right? What happens on February 1st, Jew one lacks cash, gives the Gentile the platter, go pawn this with Jew two. So if we view this as Jew 1 borrowing at interest from Jew 2 with the Gentile acting as Jew 1's interest, uh, a Jew 1's uh, agent, that would be prohibited. A Jew is borrowing from a Jew at interest. The fact that he himself didn't go, so what? The, the Gentile is acting as his agent. Construction B would say, What's going on here? The Gentile is borrowing Jew 1's platter and then using the platter to obtain a new loan from Jew 2, which is independent of the original loan. Jew 1 willingly assumes responsibility for getting the pawn, the platter back. And if we see things according to uh, construction B, then this transaction should be permissible. Says Rashi that permissible, provided that Jew 2 doesn't know that the silver platter actually belongs to Jew 1, doesn't have to know that, 
don't say anything? That's okay. He was so sure that he didn't cite any sources for this. Presumably, he accepted construction B. Why construction B over construction A? Because A is untenable. A contradicts the principle that there's no agency for a Gentile. A is built on G acting as J1's agent. There's no such thing. There's no agency for a Gentile. So A is untenable. So we have to view it according to construction B. In that case, it's permissible. Uh, we have a new loan here and uh, it's permissible. So that is Shadanemin or acceptance of law. Salavechik shows that this is fairly common. And the rabbis found a way to integrate this into the Jewish legal system. Things that are happening, things that Jews need to engage in in order to be part of the uh, contemporary commercial life, we have to find, we rabbis, that's the attitude, have to find a way to incorporate that into our legal system, if necessary, by reinterpreting the texts. Um, so you might argue this is not a reinterpretation, but construction uh, B, not construction A, this is permissible, and uh, we allow uh, our co-religionists to earn a living <laughs> in the medieval German, Franco-German environment. I should say Rashi was in France. He studied in Germany. Okay, circumventions, the pawned pawn. Another example given by Soloveitchik. On January 1st, a Gentile pawns a vase with Jew 1 for $100 uh, for two months at 4% per month. And for simplicity, we're going to ignore compounding. Actually, Soloveitchik ignores the compounding, and I didn't want to start messing with the example. It doesn't matter. Without loss of generality, as we economists like to say, the compounding part doesn't really matter here. Okay, so a Gentile pawned a vase with a Jew and took a loan at interest. A month from now, Jew 1 sees an investment opportunity with a return greater than 4%, and he needs money. So Jew 1 transfers the vase that he got from the Gentile to Jew 2 for $100. And Jew 1 and Jew 2 agree, we're going to split the interest payment that the Gentile will make one month from now in March when he comes to redeem his pawn. This looks like usury, right? Two Jews splitting the interest. But the interest is coming from whom? Interest will be paid by the Gentile. On March 1st, the Gentile wishes to repay Jew 1 $108 and redeem his vase, but Jew 1 doesn't have the vase because he transferred it to Jew 2. So Jew 1 says, please wait an hour. He goes and repays Jew 2 $104 and gets the vase back, and Jew 1 then re returns the vase to the Gentile, and they've split the interest without compounding. There's $8 of interest, $4 for each Jew. Is this permissible? Well, construction A, Jew 1 is the debtor to Jew 2. Jew 1 asked J2, Jew 2 for money. He gave Jew 2 a pawn, and he received the money. Looks like there's a, tran a transaction, usurious transaction between two Jews. That's how the layman would view it. According to construction A, this should be forbidden. But construction B says the Gentile is the debtor to Jew 2. The interest was paid by Jew 1 to Jew 2, who that's not the debtor. The pawn pawn is permitted. Says Rashi, it's permitted. Why? Construction A is untenable because it contravenes. There is no agency for a Gentile. Construction B is a triangular relationship. Let's go back to construct to, uh, where's that? Yeah, construction B, Gentile is the debtor to J2. Uh, interest was paid by J1 to J2. So the debtor is not the one paying the interest. That's a triangular relationship that's permissible. Yes, there's interest, but the one paying it is not the one who borrowed the money originally. 
By Rashi's times, the Salavetia, debt transfer via pawn transfer was a fact of life. You had mobility. It wasn't practical to um, use the constructs of debt transfer in the Talmud. Uh, for instance, triple presence. You have to have the borrower, the lender, and the new uh, creditor who's buying the debt. They all have to be together in the same room. That's not practical in a mobile commercial society. So debt transfer via pawn transfer, that's a fact of life, and the rabbis accept it, even though it's not consistent with the Talmud. The Talmud has methods of debt transfer that are not well suited to a highly mobile commercial society, but the rabbis understand we've got to be flexible. We've got to allow the uh, modes of uh, commerce and credit that are common uh, today uh, if we want our co-religionists to be able to earn a living, we're going to have to be flexible. We're going to have to find a way to incorporate German systems of uh, credit and, and contemporary methods, and, and, and we do that. Sometimes requires radical reinterpretation of previous uh, sources. Uh, now I move to a new academic source. Again, this is not something that I originated. I took this from uh, Gamerin. It's, called, it's a book called Jewish Law in Transition. Loans of produce. Uh, do we have time to do four more examples or I should maybe skip this one for now? I think, I think we'll move uh, forward. Buying on credit. According to the Mishnah, it's prohibited to charge a higher price for credit sales. Actually, I remember that the gas stations here in the US used to charge more for credit as opposed to cash, but that's a credit card, but it's a little different. But uh, charging a higher price for credit sales is prohibited. Rashi and his Talmud commentary and other medieval rabbis said that credit sales are uh, permitted as long as no cash price is quoted. If we say it's $110, and we don't ever verbalize it. If you were paying me cash, I would charge you 100. Just don't say that. This is the price, and the understanding is that uh, the payment will be delayed. You don't say anything more, that's fine. Even though everyone knows that there's an interest component in the price, that's okay. Maimonides in his Mishnah Torah and Responsa say, uh, says, if everybody knows what the market price is, and the market price is lower than this person is charging, that would be forbidden, even if nobody said anything. However, credit sales are permitted where the buyer buys bit by bit and repays bit by bit in the context of a long-term relationship. So this is how things work. And if I prohibit this, most livelihoods would be canceled. People would not be able to make a living. So I'm going to permit that. Mortgages. Uh, in Talmudic times, and maybe thereafter, lenders occupied the mortgage property and enjoyed the usufruct. So if we have to pay 100% of principal and the lender enjoys the usufruct, that's interest. So the Talmudic rabbis devised a mortgage with a deduction. Some said it was okay, some said it wasn't. But a mortgage with a deduction means that a fixed sum will be deducted annually from the principal to compensate the borrower for the fact that the usufruct is going to the lender. Rashi and Maimonides said it's permitted for a field or a vineyard only because the lender is assuming risk. Once he's assuming risk, that's not considered interest. Field or vineyard, but not a house. Rashi's grandson, Rabbi Jacob Tom said, houses also involve risk. It could collapse, it could burn down. So that's also permissible mortgage with deduction for a house. Maimonides went far, very far to be lenient and said, a token deduction is sufficient. And this became, could take 600 years to repay the debt, that's okay. Mortgages with deductions became standard practice in medieval Spain. And Rabbi Joseph Chaviva put it this way, it's permissible where the deduction is less than the usufruct. So this is clearly, uh, clearly, the, the uh, borrower is paying more than uh, what he borrowed. And key condition, the lender is assuming risk. Once he's assuming risk, he's not for sure going to 
uh, gain, then it would be permissible. Investments, and we're getting towards the end. Uh, ISCA is called. An investor gives a working partner money. Half is a loan and half is a deposit. All profits and losses are shared equally. The Mishnah redacted 200 CE required that the working partner be paid for his labor because if he has to give free labor, that's a form of interest, rabbinically prohibited interest. He has to be paid for his labor, like an idle worker. That's the uh, view that was accepted by the medieval rabbis. There are other views how much he has to be paid. This was the view that was accepted, like an idle worker, sort of like a minimum wage worker. Maimonides said that for the deposit portion, the investor is the one who bears the risk of loss or theft. So both of these provisions are problematic. If the lender or the investor wants to earn a return on his money, having to pay for the working partner's labor, disadvantage, not, not good, and bearing risk of loss or theft for half of it, the deposit portion, that's a big minus. So the investor doesn't really like either of these provisions. So now, in the medieval uh, period, the rabbis are going to loosen these uh, conditions and make them less onerous for the investor. By Abraham ben David, who is the chief critic of Maimonides, but here he's writing a responsum, nothing to do with specifically with Maimonides here, but that's how he's famous, the chief critic of Maimonides. Uh, he altered the terms of the ISCA to favor the investor in two respects. The first respect was a token wage is acceptable as long as it's mutually agreed. <laughs> and the second uh, alteration, he shifted the risk of loss or theft of the deposit portion to the working partner. And he advised the investor, this is what you should stipulate, quote, Lend it only with good pledges of silver and gold, and always put the money under the ground in order to guard it from fire and thieves, and guard the money and the pledges with exceptional guarding, meaning it's not sufficient to guard it in the normal manner. It has to be guarded with exceptional uh, precautions. And if the working partner failed to do so, he would be fully liable for loss and theft. So the two provisions that were onerous for the investor have now been effectively done away with. Gamerin says these conditions were unrealistic, thus Rabbi Abraham's version of ISCA was actually a legal fiction. Everybody knew that the working partner wouldn't be able to fulfill these conditions. And so automatically, in every case, he's liable for theft or loss. Thank you very much. I got a few questions for you. Uh, when does this idea of risk, because it's very important also in, in uh, Christian tradition, risk virtually cancels out in terms of user. Uh, when does it come in to uh, Jewish Understanding? Mishnah and Talmud. It's not something that was uh, created in medieval times. It was interpreted. It was, I could say, adjusted or you know, dis discussed extensively in medieval times. But it begins with um, Mishnah Tosefta, which is contemporaneous with the Mishnah. For instance, there's this idea in the Tosefta, which not all rap later rabbis uh, adopted, Tosef is not canonical. I mean, it could use it, but it's not, you know, if the Babylonian Talmud ruled like the Tosefta, then it becomes canonical. Otherwise, it's not. Uh, there's this idea that instead of paying a wage to the um, working partner, it would be possible to share the risk, if I remember it correctly, it's in Gamerun's book, uh, two-thirds, one-third, if there's a profit, 
and half and half if there's a loss, and that would be instead of paying a wage to the uh, working partners, so the working partner would get the greater portion of the profits instead of a wage. But, so that's already dates to circa 200 C. I got it. But so a Jew could lend to another Jew. Uh, this is an investment. And invest half of it's a loan. Exactly. In an investment contract, could lend to another Jew expecting interest from the other Jew if the first, if the first lender ex accepted the risk of the whole thing falling apart. I don't know about the whole thing falling apart, a poor harvest or, or yeah. a failure to profit or whatever theft or loss. It, and, and there's disagreement as to how much risk uh -huh. is, is necessary. And, and, you know, a lot of discussion of, uh, you know, the, 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 the terminology is in the Mishnaic times, uh, close to loss versus close to profit. Right. If it's too close to profit, that's usury. Right. And, and there are a lot of parameters and a lot of d different opinions, but that's the, those are the basic ideas. Now, in a, in a, in a bigger sense, these people, the rabbis are having to make sense of what actually happened in, in, in commerce, in Jewish commerce. So how much of this was actually known by the merchants themselves. This is, this is very, you know, this is obviously a culture that is kind of close kind of reasoning is de rigueur, but still um, it seems like the, the merchants are doing what they, what they do and then they're finding rabbis to basically after the fact say, yes, you can do this because this is really what's happening or I, I'm seeing what's happening in this way. So I mean, what I what I want to know is how much are the general non-rabbinic, non-judges outside the legal system? How much of this is actually penetrating down to the commercial commercial activity? As far as you know, I mean, obviously. Uh, so is this an in after the? the is sometimes it is an after the fact justification of what the community is practicing, and there's actually a tradition for that in in Judaism. It goes back to the Talmud. Sometimes the custom of the people should be accepted, even though it doesn't really fit the texts. And then we radically reinterpret the texts yeah. to make it fit the custom of the people, because the custom of the people can't be something very bad. Now, the question is, which people? Soloveitchik emphasizes yeah. self-image. What's the self-image of the community, especially in the eyes of the rabbis who are leading it? If the rabbis, as in France and Germany, if the rabbis see the community as a pious community, then what they're doing can't possibly contravene Jewish law. And then the texts need to be somehow reinterpreted to fit the, act, the behavior of the community. But as in, I think in Provence, maybe in, I think in, in Italy in the 16th century, uh, it was similar. If the rabbis see the community as not so pious, yes. for instance, they're lax in ritual matters. They may be lax um, in matters of, you know, family, marriage, you know, mm -hmm. they may violating sexual prohibitions. Once they're behaving like that, then the rabbis are not interested in legitimating their commercial behavior. So self-image, and actually Soloveitchik's um, book is uh, a revised version, at least some of it, it's a revised version of a Hebrew book that he put out in 1985, and the title was Jewish Law, Economics, and Self-Image. Mm -hmm. Self-image is critical. How do the rabbis view mm -hmm. the level of piety of the community? If the community is pious, their commercial practices have to be valid, mm -hmm. and we'll find a way to square that with the canonical texts even if radical reinterpretation is required. But if the community is not a pious community, we say they're sinners and we go on a moral crusade to get them to stop the inappropriate commercial behavior that we see. What percentage of, I mean, how often does this go to court? And what, what does the courts look like? What do, is it a rabbinic court? Is it one, one rabbi? Is it a group of rabbis who are making these judgments together? There seems to be a court aside from the specific rab rabbi making the decision. Well, these are responsive. These are not court ruling. Responsa or commentaries or legal codes, commentaries on legal codes. Um, 
one consideration, and I, I have to look at specifics, uh, Soloveitchik mentions that one consideration was that the rabbis wanted uh, cases between Jews to be adjudicated by Jewish courts. Yes. And if they wouldn't legitimate the commercial practices of the time, then there would be a situation where Jews would go to Gentile courts to adjudicate their uh, disputes. That's something that uh, is against uh, Jewish values. You want to keep that now. Very often, these things are not going to be recorded because there are reasons why things, uh, court records don't survive. Because um, I think, if I'm correct, Soloveitchik said that uh, um, I have to look it up, but yeah. possibly Jews didn't want to reveal how wealthy they were and then get taxed more. Yeah. They didn't want to, they wanted this to stay quiet. Right. So court proceedings were conducted orally, written records were purposely not left. So we don't have court records, but the rabbis wanted to keep the uh, adjudication of disputes between Jews in rabbinical courts. And therefore they had to recognize the commercial practices of the time that were externally imposed. This, this is the way it works in Germany. Uh, Pawnbroking, for instance, it works differently in German law than it does in Jewish law. And it has to be, the, the German model of pawnbroking has to be somehow incorporated into the Jewish system by reinterpretation if necessary, because we don't want um, the commercial practices of the time to be outside of Jewish law and then incentivize people to seek adjudication, right. Jews to seek adjudication outside the Jewish courts. We don't want that. Okay. I have another question, but I'll, I'll, I'll let you. Yes. Very general question. How much assimilation is there between this whole system and Roman law? Is it just their influence? I mean, are they imitating somehow Roman law? Or does it seem to be Jewish as far as I know, Jews are not, Jewish rabbis are not reading the Roman law directly. They're obviously influenced by what's going on in the countries that they're residing. But are they reading Roman law? I mean, theologically, they're not supposed to incorporate any outside law system. But, but in practice, it happens, right? Because reality intrudes, but they don't want to to do that consciously. Now, Soloveitchik has this concept called measurable deflection. Measurable deflection means that if we read the sources uh, in the normal manner, right, we would not reach the conclusion that a particular rabbi reached. He reached a conclusion that differs from any normal intellectually honest reading of the uh, canonical sources. In that case, we have to say that some um, external reality was intruding and forcing him to interpret differently than an honest reading of the text would uh, say. So he's saying we, we shouldn't automatically assume that there's an external pressure. But if we see that the reading of the text by a certain medieval rabbi does not square with the way it, it, it looks like it should be read, it looks unconvincing, it looks forced, then probably there's an external reality that's intruding, forcing him to think differently, write differently. Now, to admit that openly, that's not the way religious law systems work. And I would say that in the contemporary, um, contemporary um, environment, it's a misconception to say that Orthodox Judaism never changes. Orthodox Judaism purports not to change or tries to minimize the uh, extent of change that uh, it admits to, but it changes. However, it changes in a way that seems organic, seems to come from within the system, from within the sages decided this way or that way, the sages dealt with new realities and this is what they decided. But to admit change, to admit there's this external force that we can't reckon with, we have to give into this external force, that's not admitted openly. Hmm. It happens, but it's, it's not supposed to be admitted openly. And Soloveitchik says that the moment you admit it openly, then you have to back away from it. It has to be done implicitly, surreptitiously. It, it, it's not to be admitted openly. Like that's for academic scholars to uncover, right? Academic scholars will say, 
that uh, there's change and the change is happening due to external forces, but the internal religious discourse is loath to admit that. And, and that would be within, you know, rabbinic Judaism of that time. Orthodox Judaism today functions in that way. Conservative and reform Judaism are very different. That, that's an, a whole other discussion. But Orthodox Judaism and the traditional Judaism of the medieval times wouldn't openly admit uh, incorporating external realities, if possible. Yes. Um, I wanted to pick back up on the theme of risk. So uh, I heard you say that Mishnah and Tosefta are, are sources of the idea of risk and that they're very, very old. When the uh, idea of, of risk is introduced there, is it introduced by example? Is there a definition presented? Um, how, do, how, do, how is risk initially presented? Uh, in, uh, in I'd have to open up Gamarin and look at the details. Does anything pop to mind, though? Uh, what risk? Well, um, uh, what we have here is loss. Maimonides said loss or theft. And I'd have to look at Maimonides and see where he derived it from and, and, and look at the original sources, you know, from Mishnaic times, circa 200. The answer is there. I just don't happen not to recall it. Okay. Yes. Was, was selling simple insurance permitted in Jewish law? I pay you a floor. I pay you a floor in a month, and if my warehouse burns down, you you make me whole for the burnt down warehouse. When does insurance originate? Is, is, is this is, is the do the, do the rabbis have a problem with that? Ah, so in, in the 20th century, there a was a response from about that. that uh, but, but it was really, a bit, it was about buying insurance. Is buying insurance a form of, you know, person doesn't really trust in God. Uh, and to dispel that notion and to say a person should buy insurance, you know, and that, that, that's a contemporary discussion. I don't recall if insurance originates, it must have, when does it originate in, uh, late. you would know. Surprisingly late. Uh, late 15th, 16th? 14th, 15th. 14th, 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 14th century. Yeah, like late 14th century. Late 14th century. So it doesn't really yeah. exist for much of the period that I'm studying. And I would say, um, presumably when it originates, a Jew could purchase insurance from, in, in the broader society, but I don't think this is a Jewish issue. Not that I know of. It's a great question. I don't think it's a Jewish issue. Certainly not at this point. Today, you have a lot of insurance salesmen who are Hasidic Jews. If you look at, uh, you know, what's going on in, in New York, as I recall, the equitable, you know, well-known companies, you know, in neighborhoods that are ultra-Orthodox, you'll see Hasidic Jews selling insurance. Yeah. As I recall, maritime insurance was briefly controversial in Christian capitalism. <laughs> Why? Came, came around to it really pretty quick. Is it a form of usury? Yeah. And it was a question whether it was, whether it was usurious. Uh, and they decided not, but they did argue about it for a little bit. I, I don't recall any Jewish literature on that, but there may be in the later. They build their insurance into the contract. So yeah. Who was responsible? Who was not responsible? That's the way it was done. Right. And there were then controversies about whether insurance, what, whether what was in fact in being passed off as insurance. Yes. Yeah, there, this was a big issue in the 16th century. Although this sounds like something that a rabbi might wish to permit yeah. if, those, if, if yeah. that was the common commercial practice. I mean, there's a lot of flexibility when, with regard to business matters. With regard to ritual matters, you know, to come and say, well, people are commonly eating uh, unslaughtered meat. Let's permit that. Absolutely not. The flexibility that you see in monetary matters, there are other matters in which things were different. And, and in fact, the, the situation is basically the same with Christian canon law. Uh, yeah, it is. They're it, also it, being it, more it, flexible over is emerging business practices pretty easily. Yeah. But it yeah. was, and, and it got stuck on some of the earlier decisions. Yeah. And stuff like that, yeah. but it signs a way to kind of, yeah. Your categories were very helpful, the robbery, quasi-ritual. I'm, I'm curious, um, just kind of going off of this a bit, like, first of all, like, why are you quasiing it? Is it just ritual? And then is that because of the, like, if, if the ritual stuff is less flexible, is there, 
is that that category um, imagined as less flexible than like that particular way of reading, less flex, setting you up for less flexibility than some of these other. Because the quasi ritualistic formulation um, understanding lead to less flexibility. I, I haven't thought about that. I, I'm going a little bit out of order. Um, I, I don't know, I haven't thought about that, but I should say that these three categories, I didn't originate them myself, but I took them from Hebrew sources um, that uh, were never translated. In fact, these sources are sources that I found on the internet where various religious academies have discourses and the Talmudic lectures you know, which are not seeking to find out what is the practical law necessarily, but to engage young students in Talmudic thinking, to teach them how to think like a Talmudist, and to say, you know, there are these three different approaches, and here are proof texts, proof texts in favor, or here are, are rabbis that took this approach versus rabbis who took that approach. These are, you know, contemporary restatements of... Uh, the medieval sources from religious academies rather than academic sources. And I even found a video class on this topic, which I couldn't watch all of it, but um, you know, it's still discussed today. Now, does it really have practical implications? You know, the, the ISCA uh, framework was taken in the, maybe in the 17th century. It turned into, they, they devised, a contract that basically permits all forms of interest. And the Israeli government and all Israeli banks have this kind of uh, contract that um, you know, based on this ISCA idea, you devise a, a permit of ISCA that basically permits all business loans. As long as you sign that agreement, all business loans are permissible. And so, the usury prohibition isn't so practical today. And Gamerin deals with how they got to that point. And that uh, is beyond the scope of my article. But uh, today we have, based on this risk sharing, the half deposit and half um, loan, there's an agreement that can be signed. It's, the forms are actually available on the internet. You can find them in English. There's, you know, rabbis specializing in this. And uh, yeah, so um, this gets taken further. This becomes, uh, you could say, as long as you sign this document, a blanket uh, permission for uh, usury. Now, I forgot to answer a question of yours. Typically, uh, a Jewish court dealing with monetary matters had three judges. Okay. Last question. Yeah. Big question. This, there is no agency for a Gentile. Uh, it seems to be, it's news to me that this is, that this is such a pivotal element of Babylonian Talmud, but that must have been fudged. Also, that would have to be fudged considerably. I can see that it, 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 it would come in when it, when, it, when it could come in and it would have to be gotten around when it couldn't be gotten around. Jews were living as a very minority population in much larger Christian culture. It's very hard to imagine that they didn't have dealings with Christians and which Christians would want to do. Well, the Talmud actually says that um, you know, if you if you look at this, yeah, yeah. The the obvious implication is that uh, Jews could borrow at interest from other Jews simply by using a Gentile as an intermediary and say. Yeah, he's acting as a principal because there's no agency for a Gentile. Now, the Talmud explicitly prohibited this. Yeah. The Talmud foresaw this. So that's not possible. However, more complex transactions, it's possible for the medieval rabbis to say that because there's no agency for a Gentile, uh, <laughs> construction A is untenable and construction B has to be uh, yeah. is, the, is the only construction that makes any sense. And even if this seems to strain credulity yeah. Yeah. or seems to be less logical to the layman than construction A, but construction A is impossible because there's no agency 
for a Gentile. So this is a somewhat more complex transaction, but the simple transaction, a Jew borrows from another Jew with a Gentile as an intermediary, that was explicitly forbidden by the Talmud. Yes. I'm just trying to make sure I'm following some things you said. So like the reinterpretation of the Talmud is, is uh, less about like, uh, uh, like just permitting, um, permitting sin, right? And like uh, keeping uh, the, the community happy and more about um, keeping the community uh, within the, the Jewish courts and earning a living. Now, I actually wanted to show you, but I didn't know if I would have time. There's a famous passage of Nachmanides, a commentary to the Bible, where he says, interest is perfectly justified, perfectly fair, but Jews are expected to operate on a higher moral plane. A Jew has to do loving kindness for a fellow Jew. There's nothing wrong with it, but we expect Jews to give free loans to other Jews. And there's so much, there's so many texts that emphasize how important it is to give free loans. And to this day, there are free loan societies that operate uh, the ultra-Orthodox in Israel, especially are, are very, uh, very into this. And uh, there was a book in the 19th, or early 20th century that tried to promote uh, free loan societies and depositing as much of your money in that as opposed to a bank. Even if the bank has is a non-Jewish bank, or the bank has this uh, permiss, you know, the contract of ISCA that permits uh, paying interest, still free loans. That's the way things should be, and if the, the tradition of free loans is very strong. I didn't have time to show you the texts. On the one hand, the prohibition against usury. On, a, on the other hand, the blessing that one gets for giving a free loan, and this is in uh, Nachmanides and many many other sources. Uh, I don't know if I have any time. I could show you the Nachmanides. I actually brought the whole Nachmanides text in three slides, but it, it's really worth reading. It's. Do we have time to read that, or should we well, I don't adjourn? Know. I'll, I'll, I'll I'll stay to watch it, but other people, it's, we're, getting, we're getting pretty late here. Let's do it. Ten minutes, sure. Okay. Uh, so let's see what we can say. I brought this uh, famous uh, text from Nachmanides' commentary on Deuteronomy twenty-three. 20 is saying that uh, there's an admonition to the borrower as well, which is actually very interesting. The borrower is saying, uh, I'm willing to do this. The, the borrower is also a sinner. In fact, everyone who's involved, uh, guarantor, scribe, they're all sinners. Unlike all civil cases, if a person wants to damage his belongings, he may do so. So what, what's, what's wrong with this? However, because of the habitual nature of this sin, Scripture admonishes the borrower as well. And he explained here, a heathen's interest is permissible. He didn't say that with regard to robbery and theft. Robbery and theft, that's forbidden across the board. Doesn't matter who you're stealing from. Doesn't matter what faith the person is. Usury from a heathen, however, is permissible. Borrowing for interest, it's voluntary. Both parties agree. Why is it prohibited? Brotherliness and kindness, that's why. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Beware that they, not, they might not, there should not be a base thought in thy heart, and thy, thine eye be evil against thy needy brother, and thou give him naught. Therefore, there's a blessing. A person does an act of mercy, an act of compassion. For that, there's a blessing. For charity, for acts of mercy, the scripture doesn't bless someone. Blessed be he who doesn't rob. Blessed be he who doesn't commit fraud. But the scripture does bless those who give free loans, charity, mercy, love and kindness. Charging interest to a non-Jew, that's permissible. But theft, absolutely not. However, interest, which is, here he's, I guess, repeating himself. This is the original text. Interest, which is set with the knowledge and will of both parties, was only prohibited from the perspective of brotherhood and loving kindness. Love thy neighbor as yourself. You would want to get a free loan? Give somebody else a free loan. For he shall do loving kindness and mercy with his brother, that is the brother versus the other, right? When he lends to him without interest, and that's considered justice or charity. 
again, there's a blessing for giving a free loan, for loving kindness. There's no blessing for those who refrain from theft and overcharging, which is a whole other uh, kettle of fish. But it doesn't bless someone who doesn't overcharge. Scripture doesn't bless those who don't overcharge, those who don't steal. That's taken for granted that you don't do those things. But a person who gives a free loan to another Jew out of loving kindness, that's tremendous. That's, that's a great. And giving a loan, giving loan is a form of charity. Maimonides actually has different uh, levels of charity. The greatest level of charity is to give a person a livelihood and make him self-sufficient. Yes. What if you give a free loan to a gentleman? That's fine. Uh, oh, uh, actually. That should, be, that should be loving kindness too, right? Um, well, there's a commandment, according to many medieval authorities, including Maimonides, there's a commandment to charge interest to the Gentile, to create that difference between the brother and the other. Now, whether or not that's a severe violation to give a free loan to a Gentile, I don't know if it's severe. It's, it's, it's like, according to those who say there's a positive commandment to charge interest to a Gentile, so that's failing to fulfill a positive commandment. It's not the most severe thing in the world, I would think. But according to many medieval authorities, it's a commandment to charge interest to the Gentile. Yeah, I mean, that say, creates that separation. You might say giving a free loan to a Gentile who is not part of your community is even more loving kindness. It's a, a higher grade of loving kindness, but nobody ever says that. I mean, if I, if universalism, I, th th this is a particularistic commandment, as, as Nachmanides understands it. And you're thinking in a universalistic sense that I think would be foreign to medieval rabbis. Now, that's the question, you know, they're living in a society, many of them, where there's persecution, where, where life is precarious. 1096, you know, Rashi saw the community <laughs> where he studied destroyed. No, it was a spire, worms, and mines were destroyed in the Crusades, 1096. So I, it's hard for me to see the medieval rabbis. Some were, 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 well, 1492, that came later, but you know, they were exposed to anti Semitism and, and their, their life was not so simple. So I don't know that they would be thinking universalistically. Today, in democratic countries, Jews might be thinking in more universalistic ways. Uh, ways, but I think that would be alien to the medieval Jewish mentality. That's what I would think. Nachmanides' interpretation very roughly it winds up being the Calvinist view. Ah. The, the, the prohibition on charging interest, that interest by natural law is in fact just. You know, Nachmanides yeah. disputed the Christians. Yeah. He, he disputed with Pablo Cristiani and I think he was kicked out for, according to the Jewish side, you can read this, Nachmanli's disputation, according to Jewish understandings of it, he was kicked out of, was it Spain? Because he, because he was victorious in this uh, debate. Now, actually, one, one, there was a Rabbi Meir Hamiili, polemical. He said to the Christians' uh, side, why is it that you are attacking us for usury? And you're so fastidious about usury, usury, the other commands of the Old Testament you don't care about. You don't uh, avoid non-kosher food. You don't, well, the, the other ritual commandments of the Old Testament you don't observe. So how come usury is such a big deal to you? And that's fascinating, but we can't really learn very much about how Jews thought uh, themselves internally from what they say to Christians, because what they say to Christians, you know, in a polemical setting, you know, that, that might not, that might be very different from what they're really thinking themselves. As far as I know, and I think that I may be wrong about this, but uh, I think that as far as I know, Calvin was the first Christ, major Christian commentator to interpret the man on as a, as a, as a ritual commandment. Rather Which than book that. is, is that uh, Nelson is the book? Uh, yeah. Brother, other. Yeah, sure. I moved and I can't find my copy of it. That's a problem. But uh, I, I remember in an earlier work of mine citing Nelson and Schatzmiller. Yeah, that sounds right. Uh, I hope that uh, we'll have access to the audio recording so that I can uh, 
uh, taking into account all the wonderful comments that I received today. Quick question. If we have time. Sure. Okay. Uh, so what, who are the judges? Judges in rabbinical courts? Yeah. So they would just be rabbis? Well, they had to be qualified. They had to uh, have been ordained. Uh, I, I mean, typically in a monetary, I'm going back to the Talmud, the system of monetary uh, law is that each party chooses one judge and the two judges that were chosen by the parties choose a third. And that's how you get to a court of three and monetary cases should be judged uh, by three, as opposed to capital cases, which require a minimum of 23 judges. And then and there was the great court in Jerusalem that was situated next to the temple, which had 71 judges who had to have extraordinary qualifications. They were supposed to know 70 languages so they could accept testimony without translation and understand it themselves. And um, uh, yeah, so typically three judges. Um, it's hard to say, you know, again, court records were not kept probably purposely, but um, usually three judges. So, so I don't know if we have time, but uh, if, so there would be a, a pool of rabbis and so they would be picking out of this pool who were specifically qualified or just generally any rabbi who is ordained could be selected. That's a good question, whether there's a distinction between... I mean, it, today, the chief rabbinate of Israel gives an ordination uh, to be a rabbi. That's the basic ordination. And then the standards are pretty high. And then there's a standard for uh, being a judge, or being a judge, very, very high standard. That's beyond being a rabbi. Uh, I don't think that they had that at the time. I think it was just recognized who was a serious enough and learned enough person and the parties kind of gravitated. No, it's kind of like Rabbi Moses Feinstein, 20th century New York, gave an interview to the New York Times once. He said, people just ask me questions. It, somehow people decided that I'm a worthy address to ask questions. It just happens that it's not formal. I, and, and we're talking about the greatest, you know, uh, Jewish jurists, in the Orthodox Jewish world, right, of, in the United States, and also the greatest in Israel were, were, were communicating with him and that was universally respected. He says, they just come to me. It just happens, you know. Um, it just, he just became famous for his command of the sources, also a pious person who, you know, related very, you know, in a very friendly way to everyone who, who came to ask his uh, opinion. It just happens. Like there's no formal, you know, to be a rabbi, you can be a rabbi at age 22, 23. But to be recognized as being on that level, it, it's there's no formal, it, it just the community gravitates towards a certain person and he becomes. Now, is that what happened in medieval times? Good question. What was this rabbi's name again? Uh, the rabbi I'm talking about now, Rabbi Moses Feinstein, who lived in New York. Uh, passed away in 1986. He was an immigrant from Eastern Europe, escaped communism, uh, I think 1937 arrived in uh, the US, and he became the address for, for all American Jews who were committed to Jewish law in the orthodox way, right? Uh, so are you saying that the rabbis that you cited, the medieval rabbis that you cited as having these influential opinions, that they may have had no formal status at all, but they were just recognized as learning people. Well, that, that their teachers gave them ordination of some kind. Uh, how formal it was that there's no institutional thing. It just happens to be that, uh, for instance, Rashi. Rashi had three teachers, all of whom, as, as great as they were, are less famous than he was. And his three teachers were students of the very, very famous Rabbi Gershom, the Light of the Exiles, who left not, not as much written work as Rashi, but Rashi was in his tradition. So you have Rabbi Gershom, the three rabbis that Rashi studied under, who were the students of Rabbi Gershom, 
was Rabbi Gershom was from Mines, right? And uh, Rashi learned under them, and uh, he cites sometimes their their sometimes he cites their interpretations in his work. There was a community. I mean, it wasn't so large in today's. Uh, um, I don't think it rivals Jerusalem or New York today in, in terms of numbers, but the quality of what was happening. Then you have the Tosafist school. That's Rashi's grandchildren and uh, and their colleagues. And some of them were martyred. Some of them, I, I don't know if it's true or if it's a legend, that after they wrote this particular insight, the day after they were martyred, I mean, some of them were actually martyred. That that's a fact. And there's an inf there's a school that develops a school of thought, a school of Talmudic commentary. Uh, German France versus let's say Provence and Spain. These are different schools, and rabbis are associated with each other, and they they may cite you know one famous rabbi who's famous today might cite another famous rabbi very often, whom we also know from his own uh, original works. And it's also a question of what survives. There's some, there's some medieval rabbis that didn't survive, or we thought they didn't survive, and then they were discovered in the 20th century. But, but most did. You know, they're, they're manuscripts, and then you know, we get to the printing press, and that's a whole, that's the story of the Jewish book is for another time. <laughs> okay, thanks very much.